Audrey, I have one main question I want to ask you. How does your uh, relationship with Free Gaza, how is it different being a solicitor by trade? First of all, not solicitor, lawyer. We just have lawyers and solicitors and barristers in the U.S. Um, I guess I, the answer is, two, is that I had twofold relationship to free Gaza. When I was on the boat, I was just another passenger, like everyone else. Um, after that, I was, was uh, in a legal capacity working with, with free Gaza and with the, whole, with the flotilla. There I gave legal advice and then I, I interviewed people before they went to the UN. That was, in two, that was way later in, in when the flotilla left that I was interviewing people for the UN uh, fact-finding mi mission on the, the attack. But I have to say that the reason that I joined Free Gaza and went on the first, on the, real, on the second trip, to Gaza was that I had been working for at that point about over seven years on and off in the in the West Bank and and East Jerusalem as a human rights lawyer for several different uh, human rights NGOs and I realized that the people on the first mission I think with direct nonviolent action accomplished more in that one trip than a lot of NGOs accomplish in years that what the NGOs do in the, when they name and they shame Israel for various human rights violations um, is kind of give facts to people who already know what's going on. The situation in the UN the situ uh, and with political leaders throughout the world is not that they don't know that there are human rights violations going on, is that they don't have the political will to do anything about it, and that therefore uh, civil society direct action is able to, at times, accomplish so much more. And uh, that's why I joined Free Gaza, as just as a, as a passenger. After that, then whatever skills that I had, um, I, I lent to them as, as, as in, my, in a legal capacity. What other activities did you do in the West Bank? Um, I was a, first when I started out, I was with the Palestinian Human Rights Monitoring Group that was in uh, East Jerusalem and then in Beit Hanina. What day were we talking? At, I, I went there in 2001 at the beginning of the Intifada, the second in, in, Intifada. Um, and I did reports on uh, settler violence on the different legal systems in the West Bank, the civil, the civilian legal system for settlers and the military legal system or injustice system for Palestinians who were maybe living in the same, in the, in this, in the same area. Um, it was called Separate But Equal the uh, report that I, that I put out on these two different and unequal legal systems. Uh, then I uh, set up a settler violence hotline along the lines of a uh, domestic violence hotline that we, that, that we had in the, in, in the U.S. where victims of settler violence could call up, um, could get legal advice, and then we would follow them. We would we would go with them to the Israeli police and report, help them report what happened to them. Uh, sometimes we had given them cameras so they could actually take pictures of, of, of who the the perpetrators were. Then we would collect evidence because well we went with them to file complaints first of all because the police didn't do anything unless they were uh, somebody kept on their butts to make sure that they that they that they did anything. Then, when when complaints were sent to the prosecutor, the prosecutor usually did not collect evidence. So we helped collect evidence that the prosecutor could use to uh, to go to court with. And then we would we would help the victim get to the courts because the court 
was in East Jerusalem, and usually they didn't have have the uh, right doc the documentation to get to get into East Jerusalem even to appear. We would help them get the the occupation, and we'd accompany them into court. So that was the second thing that I did. Um, then eventually, I went into uh, what was called United Against Torture, was um, a coalition of 13 different Israeli and Palestinian human rights organizations that dealt with torture prevention. And we did things, that, first of all, we documented uh, examples of torture. We submitted a report, on, a report on behalf of all the organizations to the UN Committee Against Torture detailing uh, what, what was going on. And we trained some lawyers in how to go into court and expose what was going on. Because what the general, the, the general procedure in military court is that the victim is tortured beforehand. He's arrested, and it's usually a he, but he or she is arrested. Um, is questioned and tortured, and then charged on the basis of the information that was obtained during the, the torture. Uh, and then when he gets into court, he's already ad made an admission. So he's found guilty. 99 point, I think, 7% of the cases are, uh, that go into military court result in a, in a guilty verdict, mostly on the basis of a plea bargain because once you have an admission, there's really nothing to be done, except if you can challenge that admission by saying there was torture. Yeah, I guess you could say that I went to Palestine in the first place, and my interest in the Palestine solidarity movement is in, way, in a way uh, atonement for my homies in Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn. Um, so therefore, and half of the settlers that I ran into in the West Bank were from Brooklyn, so I have a lot to atone for. Do you think the American settlers are any different to the more European settlers and the Russians and the others involved? Do you think there's anything unique about the American settlers? I don't know if they're unique, but whereas the, a lot of the Russians came and went to, to the West Bank as a quality of life matter, Mm -hmm. um, to better their their existence, the ones that come from from Brooklyn and the rest of the U U.S. are doing it for ide ideological, nationalistic, reactionary reasons. Um, so they're going to be harder to move and harder to convince that things have to change. I was eventually deported by Israel after being held in detention for four days. Uh, and this was after the, I became a passenger on the boat and got to, got, got to Gaza. When I got back, I had a job, I had an apartment, I had a dog, I had, I had friends, I had a bank account, but yet I, I was deported. Um, after that, I'm not doing this full time. I have not done Palestine solid. I already worked full time since then, but I, I haven't lost my motivation. My motivation is, st is still there. How long do you think between now and when the occupation ends? What's your prediction? I can't. I, can't, I really cannot make a prediction, and it depends on what your definition of occupation is. Um, if occupation means the West Bank, because there may be a deal reached with the, between the PA and Israel. I don't think that would solve the problem. Um, and it's not dealing with Gaza at all, as far as I, as I can see. If it means all of historic Palestine, then it's going to take a long time. Although, uh, as you know, Richard, Richard Falk always points out, that we don't, we don't know ahead of time that how quickly things can happen. It happened overnight in, when the Berlin Wall fell. It happened very quickly in South Africa. It could happen quickly. I don't expect it to happen quickly. Is there anything that you'd like to close with, particularly? Um, well, the only thing that I think that, I, that hasn't been covered is the fact that 
the reason that I first went to, uh, to Palestine uh, in 2001 and remained there is that um, I'm Jewish, not, not by religion, um, but my mother was a Holocaust survivor and so I, I was brought up with, with some kind of Jewish identity to a, to a certain extent and I therefore looked at it as my fight. Um, I think it's incumbent upon Jews, aggressive Jews um, throughout the world to say that this is not being done in my name and uh, I will continue to do that.